and as we develop this argument, the range of problems that can be created by midbrain damage can be enormous because it it's the control center for even things like appetite, sex drive, all of the basic human drives, the emotional issues that surround us all, they are controlled by midbrain structures. So damage in these areas, the midbrain areas around the ventricles, and interference with their development in small children can lead to a very comprehensive dis disability in the adult. If it's localized to a very small area, like in this area which we s is termed the internal capsule area, this is where the fibers that go from the motor cells in the cortex stream through the brain, and a tiny amount of damage in this area will give rise to cerebral palsy. And it might, if it's in both sides, lead to all four limbs being affected. If it's uh, just on one side, it might be diplegia or monoplegia, but these clumped together are termed cerebral palsy. And I've made that final note that spinal cord injury is rare. So the question is, how long do these areas of altered blood flow persist in the brain following known perinatal injury? And I think there's some surprising data out there that Dr. Lacey has already referred to. How long does the tissue swelling and the oxygen transport limitation last? How long does the hypoxia last? And then we, what we can look at is that some features of known birth injury take some time to become apparent. Delayed onset of spasticity and this particular condition termed dystonias which is where you get random muscle contractions. So these delays and persistence of these changes in blood flow provide a rationale for giving a higher dose of oxygen. And that rationale is what I want to amplify. Now, Dr. Lace has already referred to the current fashion. About a month ago, I rang some of my relatives who are expert crossword fanatics because I had this saying and I couldn't find anybody to attribute it to. And the saying is this, and maybe somebody in the audience can provide the, uh, the source. It ain't what we know, it's what we think we know that ain't so that is the problem. Anybody know? I mean, it, it sounds to me like something Mark Twain would have said and probably in slightly different words, but if somebody does know where it came from, I'll be grateful and I'll make a decent slide of it. But it perhaps is very difficult for lay people, and I'm using the term in its kindest sense, because I'm lay for a lot of areas of this life, for lay people to understand how individuals can dominate, for a time, can dominate the ambience, and fashions can get hold which are so powerful and so all-embracing that people find it extremely difficult to think outside the envelope that's being created. And therefore, really, you, ha you need a few mavericks around who actually are able to get outside this, this, this envelope. The person who I think has been the front runner in the debate about cerebral palsy is, is Nelson whole list of publications, all essentially on the same theme, that birth asphyxia, quote, has nothing to do with cerebral palsy except in a very few cases. And this is the main statement made, and you can see it dates from 1988, to attribute cerebral palsy to prior asphyxia with reasonable certainty, there must be evidence that a substantial hypoxic injury occurred and that a sequence of events occurred which would prove the clinical impact of the hypoxic insult. Why? Because I say so. Well, nobody else is saying it. Few cases of cerebral palsy meet these criteria. There are 
lots of instances in medicine, as I said, where very dominant ideas have, have really been accepted. But whilst I don't want to be too unkind to obstetricians, because I wouldn't like to be an obstetrician given current today's values, the obstetricians, the midwives, have to be extremely defensive because they are there at this most critical time. And the focus of professional criticism and parental anger is directed at them. So if there's any reason for getting away from saying that birth had anything to do with cerebral palsy, they will find it, particularly in America, where the levels of litigation are so enormous. So a few years ago, somewhere around 1995, I think it was, an international consensus was formed. And this was an organization pulled together by the internet with several international conferences to actually discuss the role of birth asphyxia in relation to cerebral palsy. And this statement basically summarizes what they want to actually uh, use as their prime mission statement. Well, let's just have a look at whether this is a realistic statement. And I think the first thing that we have to do is to look at the word asphyxia. Now, I've already mentioned grabbing people warmly by the throat. I don't want you to think I'm some kind of serial killer. Um, but, but it graphically illustrates. It was actually a statement in, in the English Parliament. But, uh, you know, it was uh, one of the many fun statements that have been made over the years. Um, like uh, in, in relation to Jeffrey Howe, a conservative poli politician, who um, they said his cross-examination was like being savaged by a sheep. <laughs> but um, essentially, the, the problem here is that we have to look at the term asphyxia in real terms, and everybody knows that if you grab strongly enough round the throat and your windpipe is occluded, then you can't breathe and you are suffering then from asphyxia. Why is that different to the asphyxia of a newborn infant? It's radically different because the hypoxia of a newborn infant is related to other mechanisms. And the delay in breathing may not actually be important at all, as we'll see. So asphyxia is a difficult term to use because it is so strongly linked with airway occlusion. Well, as always, I want to bring in an anecdote. Now, anecdotes, of course, are, are now very unfashionable in medicine. We're all, we, we, we've got to be part of a, 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 of a group, uh, a cohort. I don't quite know what a cohort is, but anyway, you've got to be part of a group. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, that if we apply group data to individuals, it often doesn't work. So I can see what's happening in America with your evidence-based medicine and your insurance reimbursement. You give the same drug to everybody at the same dose, you'll kill some, you'll make some better, and some people in the middle won't change. So, you know, where are you? Where is, where is the practice of medicine? We are, we're all ultimately the subject of an anecdotal experiment when we're given a tablet.